Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled, Themes from the Gospel of John. I don't think I need to tell you that John is full of all kinds of really important information. So we're, we're learning some interesting stuff here. This is lesson number seven in that series for November, November 16 of 2024. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow now, recognizing your presence and thankful for all the help you've given us, especially through scripture and through, as we appreciate the writings of Ellen White. And we believe that it's gonna bring us very close. The time is coming very soon for you to come back. May we be ready and may these studies help us as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So just to review something we've already talked about before and which I hope you're all familiar with already, why did John write his gospel? What was his overarching reason for writing? Jim? John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles which are not written down in this book, but these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. From okay, life two things that he's trying to make very clear. One, that Jesus is the Messiah. What does that mean? The anointed. How, how many messiahs are there? Be careful, it's a trick question. <laughs> Only one real messiah. Only one that has that designation, but the Hebrew word messiah and the word Christ mean the anointed one. So every high priest, every king who's anointed technically is a messiah, but we don't say that out loud. We don't want people to, be, uh, to become confused. But yes, okay, and so we, we're talking about what evidence is there that he is the f f Messiah, that, that he was a fulfillment of prophecy, and what evidence is there that he is the Son of God? So in this lesson, we, as we continue looking at several major themes that appear throughout the Gospel of John, we will consider some of those who believe Jesus and in Jesus. The first major theme in this lesson is echoed in John 20, 29, Twain. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. From the New King James Version. Consider these words of witnesses, uh, of witnesses for Jesus. From our Bible study guide, throughout his gospel, John has a diversity of people. People with different backgrounds, beliefs, and experiences all testifying to who Jesus was. And let me just hesitate here and give you a little quiz question here. Who was the first one to declare Jesus the Son of God? Wasn't that Peter? I mean, if you're talking oh, about no. disciples. No, I did say about disciples. Just first one. The first group of people, actually. The demon possessed people. That's right over there in Vergesa. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 So here's what we have from different people, just to mention some things. Behold the Lamb of God, First John 1, 36. We have found the Messiah, John 1, 41. We have found him of whom Moses wrote, John 1, 45. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You're the King of Israel, John 1, 49. Could this be the Christ, John 4, 29. We ourselves have heard him and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Son of the world, the Savior of the world, I'm sorry. Uh, for John 4, 12, 42, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, John 6, 68. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world, John 11, 27. Though I was blind, now I see, John 9, 25. Behold your King, John 19, 14. I find no fault in him, my Lord and my God, John 20. 28. Who were some of these people and why did they testify as they did to the identity of Jesus? Some of the witnesses in the Gospel of John include John the Baptist, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, 
the Samaritan woman of Sychar, the Samaritan people of Sychar. Remember, they came later and they said, yeah, we believe now, not because of you. Peter, Martha, the man born blind, Pilate, and Thomas, who's at the end of the line. <laughs> On one occasion, Jesus had an opportunity to make a presentation before the Sanhedrin. We're going to talk about this quite a lot today because it's a major issue. Uh, Jim? Jesus was not so shy in declaring who he was, nor in calling the witnesses to testify to who he was, even witnesses who were long gone, including Abraham. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. John 8, 56 from the New King James Version. Okay. And the Sanhedrin were happy to hear that, right? <laughs> In that presentation before the Sanhedrin, three times Jesus declared that he was God to that group of Jewish religious leaders as recorded in John 8. Now, let me just make a couple things clear that make this a little bit more of a challenge. The word uh, Yahweh in Hebrew uh, means literally I am. Well, not, it means literally to be. It's an infinitive. To be, it means, some, some have translated it the self-existent one. Um, and in, back in Exodus, where it's talking in Hebrew, God says, I am who I am. That's another way to say the self-existent one. So it's a little easier to understand why they wouldn't immediately recognize who he was in these verses. You want to go ahead and look at those, Dwayne? <clears throat> John 8. Yeah, John 8, 24. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins, and you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. Okay, there it is. Go ahead. John 8, 28. So he said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. Oh boy, okay, and then finally? John 8, 58, I am telling you the truth, Jesus replied, before Abraham was born, I am. And how did they respond? Then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Okay. So we have the great controversy in action. It was Jesus on one side representing God's side and the Jewish leaders on the other side representing the devil. This is out and out, flat out, great controversy. Abraham's support, as Jesus claimed it, was very important to these religious leaders because they regarded Abraham as their leader and guide. So where did they get that idea? Well, Genesis 12, verse 3, the Lord said to Abraham, or Abram or Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I bless all the nations. Hmm, all the nations. And that idea is repeated again and again in Genesis and in Matthew and Acts and even in Galatians. Um, you want to read that for us, Jim? Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. The scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scripture announced the good news to Abraham. Through you, God, will through you, me, God. Through you, God will bless the whole human race from the good news. Okay, God. now which passage in scripture was Abraham referring to? Hmm. <laughs> it's a trick question. That's what it says there. Well, how much scripture was available in Abraham's day? <laughs> Zippo. Not a bit. Remember that he lived long before Moses wrote any of the Pentateuch. So now we've got a couple of challenges. All nations have been blessed by Abraham's descendants because of two reasons. One, almost all the writers of the Bible were his descendants. And two, Jesus was a descendant of Abraham, and it is only through him that any of us can be saved. So that's a couple of pretty important reasons, right? 
I would like to use the word healed. Yeah, that's fine. Instead of the word saved, because it, we understand that sin is a dis-ease condition, and mm -hmm. you need not, it isn't forgiveness that you're in need of, because you're forgiven anyway. Yeah. You need healing, and healing takes, is, takes time to educate you. Okay, try to imagine yourself in the position of Abraham. He apparently was awakened in the middle of the night, talking about Genesis 22 now, and told to take his dear son, his unique son Isaac, the one about whom he had, he had received multiple visions, to a distant place and offer him as a sacrifice. Did Abraham think it was just a bad dream? Well, he, thought, he probably thought he was hearing the voice of Yahweh, but it, it, it just, the text just, uh, just says uh, God, but when you get to where it says Yahweh, later, he says, says to him, don't do this. He's, when Yahweh is talking directly. So the word, this God at, at that situation, remember he was pagan. And so oh. he, he, that's, that's their culture he came from. He just sacrificed the firstborn. Abraham took this message seriously. Obviously, God had spoken to him earlier and sent him out of Ur of the Chaldees, all the way down to this territory in the Middle East, down, well, down to Palestine. And um, Abraham believed, had faith, trusted that God was able to take care of any problems that might arise from following his guidance. Now, we got a couple of challenges here that we want to look at. Dwayne? Hebrews 11, 8, 17 through 19. It was faith that made Abraham obey when God called him to go out to a country which God had promised to give him. He left his own country without knowing where he was going. It was faith that made Abraham offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice when God put Abraham to the test. Abraham was the one to whom God had made the promise, yet he was ready to offer his only son as a sacrifice. God had said to him, it is through Isaac that you will have the descendants I promised. Now you can see where that's a problem. You, you, you know, here's the son, and you've waited for it for, what, 100 years, you waited for this son, and now you've got the promise, there's the son, he's growing up, he's healthy, he's strong, and you say, okay, now I can see that this promise is gonna be fulfilled. The descendants will come through Isaac, and now God says, sacrifice him. The idea of, of offering sacrifices is something you do to, in, a, in a pagan contest text. Well, but and, God told him to do it. Well, it's, and for maybe for different reasons, but he, God told him to do it. It says El or Elohim. Yeah. I don't remember which it is. Yeah. But it doesn't say Yahweh Elohim. Okay, go ahead. So God had said to him, verse 18, it is through Isaac that you will have the descendants I promised. Abraham reckoned that God was able to raise Isaac from death. And so to speak, Abraham did receive Isaac back from death. And the full, full story of that, of course, is in Genesis 22. But there's an apparent contradiction about Abraham's story found in scripture. Romans 4, 1 to 5 says, what shall we say then of Abraham? the father of our race. What was his experience? If he was put right with God by the things he did, he would have something to boast about, but not in God's sight. The scripture says Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. Those who work are paid wages, but they are regarded, not regarded as a gift. They are something that has been earned. But those who depend on faith, not on deeds, and, and who believe in the God who declares the guilty to be innocent, it is this faith that God takes into account in order to put them right with himself. So it's all based on faith, right? Jim, you wanna take on James 2 there? See what this says? James chapter two, verses 18 to 24. But someone will say, one person has faith and another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there is only one God? Good. The late demons also believe and tremble with fear. You fool, do you want to be shown that, that faith without actions is useless? How was 
our ancestor Abraham put right with God, it was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Can't you see? His faith and his actions work together. His faith was made perfect through his actions, and the scripture came true that said, Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. And so Abraham was called God's friend. You see then that it is by people's actions that they are put right with God and not by their faith alone. So do we have a conflict between James and Paul? Well, I have a, a little bit of a question right there because when it says um, his faith through actions worked together, his faith was made perfect. And um, further up above, how our ancestor Abraham was put right with God. It seems to me that the sacrifice, the, him going through the process mm -hmm. of the sacrifice was the evidence that he had mm -hmm. been put right with God. This wasn't, ne this wasn't necessarily the... Making him right the, to it. it but yeah, oh, okay. Well, you passed the test, therefore, now I can accept you as, as, mm -hmm. as righteous. Well, what we need to remember, and Ellen White talks about this quite a lot in Patriarchs and Prophets 153 to 155, I think it is, this is a, something that's going on with the entire universe watching. And God says, I trust Abraham. This is a Job story. I trust Abraham, watch. I'm gonna tell him to do something that seems really bizarre. And this is gonna be a test. It seems like it's really bizarre and I go through and see if he will really do it. And so the entire universe is watching. Is he gonna do this or isn't he? Does he, is he gonna do what he thinks is right, or is he gonna do what God told him to do? That's the challenge. But when... Okay, and so what did... Do you think, do you think God had said like he did bef bef in the story of Job, do you think God said, watch my servant, I'm, he's, gonna, he's gonna do this? He's the father of the faithful. That means the faithful are those who, 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 you know, see what's going on, they hear what's going on, and they, they take action. They do what God suggests that they need to do. So it was another sentinel uh, moment where God put himself clearly yes. mm -hmm. on trial. Yes. Yeah, this is a great controversy moment. His, his judgment is, is there for all to see. Yeah. Okay, well, how do you understand those apparently contradictory statements? Abraham being put right by faith in Romans, but by his actions in James. So? I think the actions followed from, from the faith. That's right. So let's, let's think about that for a moment. What kind of evidence did Abraham have? We know that God spoke to him on several occasions. He followed God's directions, and things seemed to work out. Okay. Um, then, God then, then on two or three occasions, God not only spoke to him, he appeared to him. One time as a human, just walking in with a couple of angels, and then they went down and did that the, the Gomorrah thing, Sodom and Gomorrah thing. So, what, obviously God put a lot, I mean, think about Job and think about Abraham here. God is putting a lot of trust in these people. Mm -hmm. So obviously he must have felt that they had adequate, they had enough evidence Neither one of them had any scripture, anything like that. They lived way before there was any of that kind of stuff. But they, they had, God knew that they had a commitment to following his instructions, and they both did. And at the end, God says, see what I, see what I promised? They did it. No, I, 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 don't, I don't mean to... Uh, no, challenge me. Well... 
How many generations are we away from the Garden of Eden? Oof. And yet? At least, at least 6,000 years. Well, I mean, it, for Ab till, till Abraham. Oh, oh to Abraham. And, or Job, yes. Okay. So, we think that Job probably lived about the same time as Abraham, plus or minus 100 years or something like that. Yeah. Abraham lived 1,800, 1,900 years before Christ. Uh, creation was at least 4,000 years before Christ. We don't know back there. We don't have any way of knowing for sure back there further. So we're talking 2,000 years. Um, the Bible, if you follow the Bible's guidance, it will tell us that there's something like, what, 10 generations between Adam and Abraham? I've, I don't know the exact number, somewhere like that. I, I was reading uh, so somewhere, uh, it, was, it was a compilation that Ellen, Ellen White had put together. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget the name of it now. But uh, she talked about how significant Abraham's faith was mm -hmm. for 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 God and for the rest of of the of yeah of humanity. Well, Abraham was shown a vision of Jesus far into the future. That's what that's what John says. That's what Jesus said. So we have in John eight fifty six implies that Abraham was shown a revelation of the future Messiah. This divine disclosure, I mean, Jesus said, Abraham saw my day. So we have the words of Jesus himself. This divine disclosure of glorious hope was meant to serve as a confirmation of God's universal plan of salvation. Upon beholding this magnificent revelation, Abraham rejoiced and was glad. So we just talked about how much evidence he had, quite a lot. If he saw the whole plan of salvation, or at least a major part of the plan of salvation, laid out there, and he saw the life and death of Jesus, I don't know. I'm hoping one day we'll see, in the, in the great panorama, we'll see how much that these gentlemen had to work on. Well, by contrast, the Jewish leaders needed no vision to see Christ's day, for they saw him in his mighty works in person. Instead of being joyous, as their father Abraham was, they were inst instead angry and ready to kill him. Moreover, Abraham was shown a practical application of that uh, vision, which uh, revealed the graphic plan of human redemption. Abraham served as a type of God the Father, and Isaac as a type of Jesus, God's only son. Both Isaac and Jesus, without any objection, were willing to be the sacrifice. It is hard to believe that a strapping young man such as Isaac, he was about 20, in the prime of his youth, would be so obedient even unto death. Abraham's incredible faith, yet painful reluctance in sacrificing his only son, the son of promise, typified the father's willingness to let Jesus die for humanity. The main difference between Jesus and Isaac was that substitute that was provided for the latter. Do you agree with that statement? And we'll think about that. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. But nothing was provided for Jesus. Christ's sacrifice was indeed to be the substitute for us all. In shedding his blood, Jesus gave for our redemption his life and his righteousness, which no one else possessed. And there's lots of implications of those words that we could discuss at great length, but let's move on. Another major story that John wrote is regarding the witness of Mary, the sister of Lazarus. It is very interesting to look at the entire dynamics of what was happening on that occasion. First of all, let's just look at the biblical story and then we'll look at the background provided to us by Ellen White. Jim? John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus went to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from death. They prepared a dinner for him there, which Martha helped to serve. Lazarus was one of those who were sitting at the table with Jesus. Now, let me interrupt for just a second. Okay, here we have someone is healed by, from leprosy. On one side of him is someone who's been raised from the dead. On the other side of him, <laughs> the Messiah himself. It's quite a gathering. Okay, go ahead. Then Mary took half a liter 
of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard, poured it on Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The sweet smell of the perfume filled the house. One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would help himself from it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Let her keep what she has for the day of my burial. You will always have poor people with you, but you will not have, always have me. Good news, Bible. Okay, so now let's look at these characters a little more closely. Simon, the Pharisee and former leper, was the uncle of Mary and Lazarus. Okay. Dwayne? From the writings of Ellen White, those present thinking of Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead by Christ, and who was at this time a guest in his uncle's house, began to question, saying, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? But Christ continued, Thy faith hath, hath saved thee. Go in peace. Okay, so what are we seeing? That we now see that Simon, a Pharisee, is the uncle of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Simon was the one who had raped Mary, his niece, and led her into incest and ultimately into demon possession. Ella White comments, as did Nathan with David, Christ concealed his home thrust under the veil of a parable. He threw open his host, he threw upon his host, I'm sorry, the burden of pronouncing sentence upon himself. Simon had led into sin the woman, his niece Mary, he now despised. She had been deeply wronged by him. By the two debtors of the parable, Simon and the woman were re represented. Jesus did not design to teach that different degrees of obligation to be felt by, two, by the two persons, for each owed a debt of gratitude that never could be repaid. I mean, that's the story with all of us. We're sinners. Nothing we can do about it unless God steps in and does something. But Simon felt himself more righteous than Mary, and Jesus desired him to see how great his guilt really was. He would show him that his sin was greater than hers, as much greater as a debt of 500 pence exceeds a debt of 50 pence. Okay, so now we have Simon, a Pharisee, who's gotten his niece involved in incest, she has ended up in demon possession. Okay. Go ahead, Jim. From Ellen White. Simon was touched by the kindness of Jesus in not openly rebuking him before the guests. Imagine if Jesus had openly said, well, let me tell you what's going on here. He had not been treated by Jesus that, as he desired Mary to be treated. He saw that Jesus did not wish to expose his guilt to, to others, but sought by a true statement of the case in, to convince his mind and by pitying a kindness to subdue his heart. Stern re denunciation would have hardened Simon against repentance, but patient admonition convinced him of his error. He saw the magnitude of the debt which he owed his Lord. His pride was humbled, he repented, and the proud Pharisee became a lowly, self-sacrificing disciple from the desire of ages. Okay, so here we have another Pharisee who becomes a major player in the Christian church. What a story. Mary used very expensive perfume to wash Jesus' feet. Go ahead. The perfume was very expensive, worth about a year's wages for the common laborer. Can you imagine that? Where did she get that money? I, yeah. I Don't know. ask. <laughs> well, I mean, it may have been from some very illicit activity. It may have been the fact that her family was also fair. We're also Pharisees. Might have been fairly wealthy. Been, might have been wealthy. Okay, go ahead. Mary probably bought this gift as an expression of gratitude to the Savior for the forgiveness of her sins and for the resurrection of her brother. She intended it to be used someday for the burial of Jesus. But then she heard that he would soon be anointed king. In that case, she would be the first to bring him honor. Wow. The fragrant, this is Ellen White again, the fragrant gift which Mary had thought to lavish upon the dead body of the Savior, 
she poured upon his living form. At the burial, his sweetness could only have pervaded the, the, the tomb. Now it gladdened his heart with the assurance of her faith and love. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus offered not their gift of love to Jesus in his life. With bitter tears, they brought their costly spices for his cold, unconscious form. The women who bore spices to the to the women who bore spices to the tomb found their errand in vain, for he had risen. But Mary, pouring out her love upon the Savior while he was conscious of her devotion, was anointing him for the burial. And as he went down into the darkness of his great trial, he carried with him the memory of that deed and earnest of the love that would be his from his redeemed ones forever. So Jesus had something to think about as we're going to see even more in a moment as he, as he, he proceeds on into what's coming next. Okay? Um, that's Desire of Ages, page 560. Jim? From the Bible study guide, Jesus knew what was in his heart, excuse me, what was in the heart of Mary and the heart of Judas. He knows what's in your heart as well. What should this faith tell us about the need of Christ as our righteousness transferring us, excuse me, transforming us and covering us as well from the Bible study guide. Okay. So this story and others, which we will look at in a moment, uh, remind us of another recurrent theme which runs through John's gospel. Jesus knows what is in people. He knows their thoughts and motives. And we have, there's a bunch of references there. That's just a few, many, many, many. V repeatedly, I mean, he knew about that Syrophoenician woman up in Tyre and Sidon. He knew about her daughter and he went all the way out there to heal her. He knew all kinds of stuff. I mean, if, if you look at many of them, the man who was brought, who was paralyzed, who was let down through the roof, he had drawn him when he was still at home. So clearly Jesus did not trust the crowds after the feeding of the 5,000 to have pure motives. He knew in advance that all about them and what was in their hearts. He also clearly understood the character of Je Judas from the first time he met him. He even knew that Judas was going to betray him. On another occasion, the disciples were arguing among themselves about something that Jesus had said, and Jesus, knowing that they were arguing about it, questioned them on it. He had read their comments and even their inner thoughts and if you think back to that story about the man let the paralytic lay, let down through the roof, the Pharisees are lined up over there and the, and the scribes and so forth are lined up there and Jesus is reading their thoughts. You know, they're saying in their, just in their minds, who is this guy's forgiving sins? He said, well, I'll show you how that works. <laughs> well, okay. Um, Dwayne, I think you're next. John has called upon many witnesses from every walk of life to testify that Jesus was the Christ. Now John calls upon Pilate, the governor who tried Jesus. This was an important testimony because Pilate was a Roman, a governor, and a judge. Most of the other witnesses were Jews and commoners. So now we have someone witnessing outside of the Jewish community. <clears throat> Okay, the story of the trial of Jesus is presented in John 19, 4 through 22. It is very clear that Pilate did not want to condemn Jesus to crucifixion. Repeatedly, he tried to get the crowds to allow him to release Jesus. Pilate claimed Jesus' full innocence while Jesus' own people were actually determined to have him crucified. Pilate succumbed to the pressure of the mob and released Jesus to them to be crucified. However, when Jesus was crucified, Pilate had the last word because above his head on the cross, Pilate put these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. When the religious leaders came and tried to get him to change that wording, Pilate said, what I have written stays written. Well, we may think of Pilate as a kind of wishy-washy Roman procurator in the hands of the Jewish religious leaders. On this point, he very clearly stood up for what he believed. <laughs> Good for him. Unfortunately for Pilate, a short time later, he ended up stripped of his honors, exiled to Gaul, which is the former name for France. Under deep depression, he committed suicide. Mm. Not too long later. 
Another theme that is interwoven with that theme, with the, uh, with the story, with that theme of the story, with the story of Pilate, is that Jesus came to represent the truth. Jim? Wow. Oh. Pilate had the truth himself standing before him and yet allowed the mob to bully him. Pilate sentenced Jesus to death anyway. What a tragic example of not following what your conscience and heart tells you to, is correct. What can we learn from Pilate's example about the dangers of allowing popular sentiment, even pressure, to keep us from doing what we believe is right from the Bible study guide? Wow. <clears throat> We've already noticed that the disciples, especially Peter, spoke about their belief in Jesus on several occasions. However, not all the disciples were so forthright in their testimony. Notice these brief accounts regarding Thomas, the disciple. Well, what do we call him? We call him the what kind of disciple? The doubting Dwayne. disciple. Okay, Dwayne? It was late that Sunday evening and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. <laughs> then Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So what is Jesus doing there? He's bestowing a certain amount of authority to the early Christian church. Mm -hmm. Thomas, however, was not present on that occasion. Although he had the witness of the other disciples, I mean, he has all the other disciples there. He refused to believe until he had seen Jesus himself with the nail prints in his hands and the wounds in his side. In other words, Thomas was dictating the conditions of his faith. And we have the words in John 20, 24 to 29. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, unless I see the scars of the, of the, of the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. This is someone who's been with Jesus for years already. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And I, I've ever once, once in a while thought about, okay, we're sitting here, and we're in a small room, and we're doing regular business here, and what, all, what would you do if all of a sudden, boom, there's somebody else here? And, <laughs> and especially if you knew you locked the door. Yeah, exactly and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands and stretch out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. Thomas answered, he didn't even, he didn't even bother touching him. He said, Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Do you believe because you see me? How happy are those who believe without seeing me. And look at these words from Ellen White regarding the experience of Thomas. Duane, I think that's yours. Turning to Thomas, he said, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. These words showed that he was acquainted with the thoughts and words of Thomas. The doubting disciple knew that none of his companions had seen Jesus for a week. They could not have told the master of his unbelief. <clears throat> he recognized the one before him as his Lord. He had no desire for further proof. His heart leaped for joy, and he cast himself at the feet of Jesus, crying, My Lord and my God. Jesus accepted his acknowledgement, but gently reproved his unbelief. Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The faith of Thomas would have been more pleasing to Christ if he had been willing to believe upon the testimony of his brethren. 
Should the world now follow the example of Thomas, no one would believe unto salvation. But all who believe Christ must do so through the testimony of others. Many who are given to doubt excuse themselves by saying that if they have if they had the evidence which Thomas had from his companions, they would believe. They do not realize that they have not only that evidence, but much more. Many who, like Thomas, wait for all cause of doubt to be removed, will never realize their desire. They gradually become confirmed in unbelief. Those who educate themselves to look on the dark side and murmur and complain know not what they do. They are sowing the seeds of doubt, and they will have a harvest of doubt to reap. At a time when faith and confidence are most essential, many will thus find themselves powerless to hope and believe. Very good, thank you. From Desire of Ages 807 to 808, that was a fairly lengthy passage, but it's key to our understanding of some pretty important issues. And I thought of, you know, if you just review in your mind, start from the earliest evidence in Scripture right down through how many things that you're, sh that you're sure about are compelling evidence for God and for His abilities and for Christ the Messiah, the prophecies of... I mean, of course, Isaiah said, remember, he said two things. One, if you know it's God, if He has the ability to create out of nothing, and he has the ability to predict things far in advance. Far in advance. Those are the two things that really stuck in his mind. Thomas was not the first one that John wrote about to question what Jesus had said to them. Think of just a couple of examples. Speaking to Nicodemus, at a time when, uh, I'm sorry, uh, how can a grown man be born again? Nicodemus asked. He certainly cannot enter his mother's room and be born a second time. And then the Samaritan woman, Sir, the woman said, you haven't got a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get that life-giving water? And then later, they replied, what miracle will you perform so that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? And he's just fed 5,000 men, not counting women. Let's see, could you show us a miracle? Yeah. <laughs> Give me a break, you know? Anyway, Desire of Ages 807, 808. I'm sorry, we already read that. John repeatedly conveys to us the stories of people who essentially said, show me, let me see myself, and then I will believe. Is it true that God does provide evidence? God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. These are the words from Ellen White. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon the adequate evidence provided, not irrefutable demonstration. We've added some other words there because some people have questioned that what those words mean. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. Jim? From the Bible study guide, it seems that whatever it takes to help us to believe, he is willing to do. He meets us where we are in our despair, discouragement, or doubt. John often deals with the topic of doubt in his writings. When he wrote his gospel, he was confronting discouraged church members who were challenged by Gnostic heresies about the reality of Christ. In John's day, as in ours, there are those who chose not to believe because they did not see all the evidence they desired to be scientific or... Be it scientific. Be it scientific or philosophical from the Bible. Okay. So in our days, do we have people who, for philosophical or scientific reasons, think they shouldn't believe the Bible stories? Mm -hmm. A lot of them, don't we? Mm -hmm. Major challenges. In light of all we have said so far, how much evidence do we have for the truth of Jesus' statements? Could you give a clear, resounding testimony to someone who asks you why you believe in Jesus? Can you explain not only about his life and why that is important, but also the evidence for his divinity? 
Here's a question for you. It might seem like the discipline, I'm sorry, the disciples and the other Jews living in those days had a lot of advantages over us, seeing the evidence themselves in person. See where, Jim, I think that's yours. Well, the Bible said to God, imagine having been there in person, in the flesh, and having seen Jesus do many of his, these miracles. We'd certainly believe, wouldn't we? We'd mm. like to think so. But in some ways, we have even more reasons to believe in Jesus than did those who actually saw the miracles. Why? What are some of the things that we have today that those living in the time of Jesus didn't have that should help us believe? See, for example, Matthew 24, 2, Matthew 24, 14, Matthew 24, 6 through 8 from the Bible. Yeah. And think of all the, I mean, we see stories many, many stories about Christians who've had marvelous things happen to them. That just happened by chance? No. Think of all the fulfillments of prophecies that have taken place since the days of Jesus. Think of all the reformers and others who stood faithfully, even giving up their lives to witness for the truths which we are talking about. Don't we have even more evidence for believing the words of Jesus than did the people who lived in his day? Dwayne? All during the life and ministry of Jesus, his following remained a small and harassed group of men and women who, by all human standards, should have vanished from history a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> How could they have known, as we do, that all these things would come to pass? And they have. In fact, our own faith itself exists as a fulfillment of Jesus' own prophecy that the gospel would go to all the world. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Okay, here's, there was a group of 12, and now there's only 11, and they have some other people hanging around and who more or less follow along with them. And Jesus says, oh, you're going to take the gospel to the entire world. Huh? <laughs> I mean... Very few of them had traveled even outside of Israel at that point in time. Mm -hmm. We also have the testimony of Jesus himself <clears throat> and his example to us after considering all these other witnesses we have discussed. We need to remember from our Bible study guide, Jesus is indeed the greatest witness to his own divinity and divine mission. Repeatedly and tirelessly, he endeavored to open the eyes and hearts of the intellectual and rich classes. The Savior greatly desired those, uh, those who doubted to consider the obvious evidence about himself. He ardently yearned for them to believe and be saved, though it was often to no avail. How often many of us wish to see and hear Jesus in person, but had we lived during the earthly ministry of Christ and seen all the evidence he presented, would we have believed? Hmm. When asked about what proof he had that he was divine, now here's the final words, okay? Jesus said, Jim, Matthew 12. Verses 39 and 40. How evil and godless are the people of this day, Jesus explained, exclaimed. You ask me for a miracle? No, the only miracle you will be given is the miracle of the prophet Jonah. In the same way that Jonah spent three days and three nights in, in a big fish, so will the Son of Man spend three days and nights in the depths of the earth. From the Good News Bible. Okay, so if you remember reading Jonah, uh, the book of Jonah, it says he thought he was in the grave down there. He didn't... In the best, he, he says, I'm down here in Sheol. What does the Sheol mean? Well, Sheol is the, is the Hebrew word that is often translated hell. It means the grave. So he, he thought he was in the grave for three days, just like Jesus. Uh, we know the rest of the story. He was vomited out on the shore after three days. After the Jews had killed him, Jesus was in the grave for three days. Then he was ready to give the irrefutable evidence that the Jews had asked for. Okay, what's the irrefutable evidence? Dwayne, I guess that's yours. Okay. When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, Thy father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life, 
that was in himself. Now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Those are verses John 10, 17 and 18 and John 2, 19 as well. So what is Jesus saying? A very interesting situation. He says, you kill me and then I will give you the irrefutable evidence. And what's the irrefutable evidence? Resurrection. I have the power to raise it. I have the power to rise myself. No created being, either human or angel, could ever do that. Later, even many of the Jewish leaders finally recognized Jesus' as divinity and became convinced and joined the believers. We have a couple of verses. Acts 6, verse 7, And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests. And the priests were primarily what group? Sadducees. Sadducees accepted the faith. A great number of the Sadducees accepted the faith. And Acts 15, verse 5, But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So they hadn't given up all their old ideas, but we now have talked about Simon. We've talked about Paul. Those were both Pharisees and became faithful followers of Jesus. And these Sadducees that were persuaded, transformed, they didn't believe in the resurrection. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. They didn't think there was any life beyond this life. Notice the interesting comments from Ellen White saying that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was visited by Gabriel, the angel who took Satan's place in heaven. Jesus was given a vision at that time. That vision showed Jesus the results of his sacrifice and the vindication of God and the great controversy between God and Satan over the character and government of God. Now we've talked about how the conflict between Christ and the Sanhedrin there was a, a, one of the battles in the great controversy. Now we have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We don't have time to go back and read all the passages from El. Well, we, I guess we've got part of it here. Let's go ahead and read this. Um, while this was not a witness to humans, um, it certainly was the, uh, to the onlooking universe. The witness of them had, has been probably more important than the witness to us. Jim? From Ellen White. This is talking about, this is talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Having made the decision to proceed with the plan that included his death, Jesus fell dying to the ground from which he had been, which he had partially risen. The world's unfallen and the heavenly angels had watched with intense interest as the conflict grew to its close. Satan and his confederacy of evil, the legions of apostasy watched intently hit this great crisis in the work of redemption. Okay, so there's the words. What's going on here in the Garden of Gethsemane? This is an all-out battle in the great controversy. All Satan is all, all his crew are there. God and his crew are there. Okay, go ahead. In this awful crisis, when everything was at stake, when the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, a light shone, for, shone forth amid this dark excuse me, the stormy darkness of the crisis hour and the mighty angel who stood in God's presence occupying the position from which Satan fell came to the side of Christ. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep interrupting here, but just think of this situation. Satan is there and he's doing everything he possibly can to convince Jesus to give this whole crazy idea up. Just give up the whole idea, go back to heaven. You know you can do this. Just go back to heaven. Leave us, we'll be fine here on this earth without you. And who shows up? The one who took his place in heaven, Gabriel. Wow, okay, go ahead. The, the, angel. the angel came to take the cup? Not, from, not, not to take the cup. Okay, I'm sorry. The angel came not to take the cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to drink it. With the assurance of the Father's love, he came to give power to the divine human suppliant. 
he pointed him to the opening, excuse me, to the open heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved as a result of his sufferings. He assured him that his father is greater and more powerful than Satan, that his death would result in the utter discomfiture of Satan, and that the kingdom of this world would be given to the saints of the Most High. And I interrupt for one more time. Do you think Satan heard that conversation? I don't think it was a secret to him. I mean, imagine the major battle in the great controversy, and here is Gabriel with a message from God that says, Satan, it's, a you, pivot. it's all over for you. Yeah. Go ahead. And he told him that he would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, for he would see the multitude of the human race saved, eternally saved. It seems that Jesus was quite, con was quite concerned about the testimony that was given by his friends and even some of his enemies. Remember that the first ones to declare Jesus to be the Son of God were actually demon-possessed individuals. Why are faith, belief, and trust so important to us? Do you remember the conversation that Paul had with the Philippian jailer and then with his family? Dwayne, you want to read that? Sure. In Acts 16, 30, 31, after the earthquake, he asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your family. Belief, faith, and trust are English translations of the same Greek word pistis. Think of all the stories of people whose lives have been changed by their belief in Jesus. Another major theme that is very apparent in the Gospel of John is regarding the coming of the time of Jesus, and we're not going to have time to, to go completely through this, but we know that repeatedly Jesus told earlier in his ministry, Jesus told people, my time is not, even to his mother, it's not my time, not my time, not my time. But now, as he comes to that last Passover weekend, he says, now is it my time. Now it's my time. So we think about these experiences and we're wonderful, evidence of his divinity. Thank you. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privileges we have to study these words, to think about these experiences, and to shore up our faith. May we not doubt as Thomas did and others did. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.